Welcome to Critical Issues Commentary, the podcast ministry of Gospel of Grace Fellowship, a non-denominational Christian church in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. This is Jessica Kramis, your host for this series, and I'm speaking today with Bob DeWay, Gospel of Grace's teacher and theologian and author of Critical Issues Commentary. Now, Watchman Nee is someone that Bob has written about in various articles, but we really don't have one resource that addresses the issues surrounding him and his work. And I've been seeing quite a bit of quotes of of Watchman Nee on Facebook and Twitter and different places lately, and some of them showing up from people that I would expect to be a little more discerning. So this morning, as I was preparing for this, I just did a little check to see just how popular he still is. His, there's a private, there's two private Facebook groups for Watchman Nee. One has 21,000 members, oh. and the other one has 14,000 members. And his, the Facebook page, um, the main one that claims to be his or somebody associated with him, uh, he passed away. 50 years ago or so now, but the, the Watch Mini Facebook page has 19,000 followers. Wow. So based on that, I would say his teaching is still around and going strong. So can you just give us a little background as to who Watch Mini is, and then we'll talk about what some of the issues are. Okay, well, Watch Mini was a Chinese Christian from the early 20th century. And his original writings that were published over here in America, I started reading them in the 70s. Okay. They were compilations by his students of notes that they took during lectures. And so some of the books out there, he didn't actually write, although one would assume that somehow they reflect what he taught. So some of the books that were popular when I was a young Christian were called The Normal Christian Life, 12 Baskets Full, uh, and so on. And those were two that come to mind right now. But he didn't actually okay. write those books. They were compiled by his students. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so the only books he wrote, and those are the ones that people should study if they really want to understand the theology of Watchman Nee, Mm-hmm. A three-volume work called *The Spiritual Man*, Volume One, Two, and Three. He actually okay. wrote those because he was a little worried about how long he was going to still be on the face of the earth, and he wanted to get this material. And he actually claimed that he got the material from by revelation from God, and uh, that's why you know if he didn't get it written down, it could be lost because it isn't something that an ordinary person would ever be able to glean from Scripture. Okay. Okay. So now, just to give you a background of why I'm talking about this, is I really bought into this whole Watchman Nee when I was a brand new Christian in the 70s. And I read his books, and I particularly focused when I found out that The Spiritual Man was what he actually wrote. Those three volumes I read until they were dog-eared. And I, okay. I still got one. Mm-hmm. There's volume two. I, I found that. I had to get rid of all my research books that I disagreed with when I moved home and started working from home because I didn't have room for all kind of books on shelves. But I found this one. I started rereading it here today. And uh, boy, just a little bit of rereading today totally shows me why I was so confused when I was trying to be his follower. His stuff was so confusing and so difficult. And for five years, I tried to just be this, quote, spiritual man, unquote, that he was promoting. And it was like mission impossible. And now it's interesting to me. Today, I just sat down and started rereading volume two. 40 some years later, after I finally just gave up on it and went to just following the Bible, uh, I started rereading it today and taking some notes. It makes more sense to me now that I'm actually using my cognitive abilities in my mind, which he warned against, because that would make you oh, soulish. No. So I just analyzed it logically and rationally based on scripture alone, and I realized 
that he has air after air after air and misuse of scripture. Okay, but back then when I was thinking this is from God, I need to follow it. I I worked and worked and worked and wore out my three original three books, going through them, and I never did feel like I achieved this spiritual man status that he was talking about. So then the spiritual man is something that you strive to become, not something God does in you? Well, he'll say, uh, absolutely, God does it in you. But you kind of hold the key. Because if you keep uh, functioning out of your soul, then you're going to end up getting uh, problems. You'll become soulish. And the soulish man is basically synonymous uh, although not really, but it'd be similar to what Paul talking about the carnal man. Okay. Okay. And so he had this scheme that was laid out in these three volumes of what I call anatomical sanctification. And All right. it's based on the idea of the body, soul, and spirit from this one passage. And then he lays out in great detail different faculties of the body of the soul and of the spirit and how these interact with each other and how they interact with the outer world and what we must know and learn in order to be the spiritual man. And it's very, very difficult, very, very confusing. Okay. And mm -hmm. I know from experience because I did everything I could to try to be that spiritual man. And I finally decided a better idea is just believe the word of God. All right. So do we even find this idea of figuring out body, mind, and soul somewhere in Scripture? Is Okay. What is, I, it, what is he basing that on? Okay, I've got this one verse. I did a bunch of work here today to be ready for doing uh, radio on this. I'm, I'm glad I'm finally doing this after all those years I spent trying to be the spiritual man. It's very gratifying to finally maybe help somebody else not waste their time with this stuff. But okay. here is the one key proof, and then there's another one that kind of goes along with it. It's 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Uh, okay. This verse is the bedrock verse for Watchman Nee's whole scheme of anatomical sanctification. And I mean by anatomical, the tripartite man and how different parts of that divide up, Okay. Okay. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 from the New American Standard says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now, needless to say, Ne was a tripartite uh, guy. He believed that body, soul, and spirit were three distinct uh, uh, things that are part of the human being, but that's not universally agreed upon by Bible scholars and theologians. Many believe that uh, when it talks about the human soul and spirit, it's just two ways of describing the same thing. That you right. have the body and then you have the inner person. Okay? And so there's a lot of debate about that. Now I would say this. Let me just lay this out, because from what you're saying, he, uh, he has a lot of followers out there to this day. Mm -hmm. These teachings are wrong, even if you did believe in this tripartite idea. There's nothing in this verse that would lead us to all of the things that he teaches in that three volume work. And if you're reading his other books, he didn't write them. Um, I don't think those other books did me any good either, but they're not, they're not what he wrote. They're notes from his students that they compiled. The three volume, The Spiritual Man, that is knee. That's everything. So you need to know those three if you want to be a student of knee. Now, I wouldn't recommend it because I think you're wasting your time. Uh, because it is a tacit rejection of Scripture alone. Knee very right. much believed in revelations from God beyond scripture 
that were absolutely necessary for us to uh, prosper and grow as Christians. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And if you believe in Scripture alone, so I would say any Lutheran or Reformed person would have to say, knee is off bounds because he rejects Scripture alone. I have found um, his three-volume work, The Spiritual Man, in a Reformed book list for homeschooling. Unbelievable. Well, it shows yeah. you the lack of discernment. Yeah. Okay? Well, let me just, so. let's just start with that basic verse, okay? Okay. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Now, Gordon Fee, who, um, I believe he's Pentecostal, but Gordon Fee has written some great commentaries on various books of the Bible, including 1 Corinthians and one here on 1 Thessalonians. Um, and he makes some good points. Um, he says that what Paul is emphasizing is holy or completely. Notice it says, May the God of peace sanctify you entirely. So Paul is emphasizing the entire person being sanctified. And it's not, um, Paul himself isn't saying being able to distinguish what your soul is doing at any given moment versus what your spirit is doing is the key to sanctification. And he reads that in there, but it's not really in the text. Okay. The, the wish, this is like a benediction or a prayer wish, where Paul is concerned that Christians would be sanctified. The whole person would be sanctified. And now, when I have uh, preached about this and taught about this over the last 40 years, since I left the whole Watchman Nee thing behind in 1980, I pointed out that if you look at the whole counsel of God, God deals with us as persons. And if you look at the Old Testament, when it talks about the heart, it's talking about that part of us, the inner part, that would turn to God. Right. Okay? Serve me with your whole heart. When it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, it means the whole person would be devoted to loving God. Right. Well, Nee is saying, and I, I got some quotes from that, I don't know if we'll get to it in this session, but we will, that the key is to divide up those parts and see how they interact with each other. I have a hard time even understanding how we would do that. How do I know how my mind is different than my body, which is different than my soul? Well, you might be able to do the mind-body thing a little bit, but when you go from soul to spirit, it gets real dicey. And I don't personally even see the difference between soul and spirit. Well, does does he make one. some distinction there? There, there? there may not be one, but me has all kinds of details about how that's supposed to work. He, the spirit, see, speaks to us through intuition, not through reason and rationality. Frankly, okay. uh, Jessica, after the series we just finished on yoga, today I sat down and just seriously read the first part of volume two of Watchman Nee's book. I thought, man, I think I can see where this Eastern stuff comes in. Because the only way you can read his book and determine whether it's worthy of believing is by rationally uh, contemplating his ideas looking at the scriptures he's talking about and trying to uh, see whether the scriptures will actually teach what he is drawing out of the scripture. But it's almost a catch-22 to use a colloquialism or a, uh, something that's just going to be frustrating because if you analyze it biblically and you look at 1 Corinthians 5, 23, and you say, yeah, it is teaching the difference between the soul and the spirit, and we better know the difference, and the soul is doing one thing, and the spirit's doing something else, and this, if we follow the soul, we'll be soulish, i.e. carnal, and if we follow the spirit, something else. All of those are rational thoughts. Right. So even trying to be the spiritual man, you get stuck being rational, and then you end <laughs> up being soulish. Dear uh, listener. <laughs> I'm a it's man impossible. who spent five years of the decade of my 20s trying to do that. 
I, I really tried. I was living in a commune. Jessica, you were a little girl when we were there. So you know yeah, exactly I have what I fond memories of it, but I was just a kid. If you were a kid, you didn't have to try to figure it out. You yeah. just got to play with the other kids and ha have a nice life. But in that group, we were so trying to be pious and to lay aside the world and to not be carnal and uh, to find somehow the most perfection we could on this side of eternity. And I tried and tried and tried to figure this out. But you know what was wrong, Jessica? I always ended up analyzing it rationally. And then it sort of thwarted his point, which you're supposed to follow what he called intuition. So let's talk about that for a second. Intuition can be any number of things. And if we're not using our rational mind or we're not using God's words to kind of filter this intuition, we could be chasing after anything. There were people in our group that were a lot better at intuition than I, I was, but they mm -hmm. ended up um, saying, well, you had to communicate it, even if it's just like the old preachers would say, better felt than telt. Okay. I used to hear that one. But I don't even know what that means. But if somebody yeah. felt something and they said, I, I sense God guiding us, the irony, and I hope some of our listeners can be spared what I went through. The irony was, even when they shared what their intuition was giving them in our prayer meeting or whatever kind of meeting we have where decisions are being made, we couldn't help but do anything but analyze it rationally. Right. Should we send a That's... missions crew uh, from our group up to Leech Lake, which we had a Camp Zion Harbor to spend part of the summer there praying for people? I mean, we were making decisions like anybody else would. And so all the discussion ends up being rational. And frankly, Nee's book is written in rational language. We can read the words and know what they mean, yeah, or at least it, try. Right. And so trying to lay, lay aside the, the potential damage of soulishness, see, according to him, the mind uh, or the soul had mind, will, and emotions. And okay. the, will, the will was a good thing, and then the emotions were kind of neutral, but the mind could give us problems. And if the mind, according to me, followed the intuition of the spirit, then that was the spiritual man. But if the mind took his cues from data that was coming through the body, um, sense perception or whatever, it was very confusing. Then you, you had our time, well, which of, I don't know which one I'm following. How would you know? Is there any rational way of knowing? Well, a lot of it comes down to motives. And then it gets even harder when you're trying to be a spiritual person, okay? A lot of it, if, if you're not careful, it can really lead to introspection. Right. And if you do enough introspection, you can convince yourself you have bad motives just about every single time. And so yeah. that introspection can become crippling to people. And I remember thinking, well, if I do this, then I'm just promoting myself and I'm probably soulish. And uh, I think I'm probably selfish, and that's why I want to do this or that. And trying to die to self just made self seem all the more real. Yeah, I, I, you know, there was a struggle going on. Now, you wouldn't have noticed that because most of the time I just laid that aside and went out and fixed cars. So that made more sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Here. You know, so I, I I was always attracted to people that were more engineer types like I was. Right. And so I ran the garden and made sure we had food. I fixed the cars. I counseled people. And I actually did preaching and stuff. But even in my preaching, I was just preaching the Bible because I didn't really know how to do anything else. Which was actually good. Well, let me tell you the irony. I did. Uh, this, I'm sort of sh sharing my story here in this first part of this. Here's the irony in the whole thing. Two of my favorite books during those years 
were Escape from Reason by Francis Schaeffer. Okay. And The Spiritual Man by Watchman Nee. Hmm. Now That's today, an interesting combination. Yeah, well. Back then, we used to talk about the double-minded man. I think that's what it made me. Today, yeah. when I was rereading me, I can understand it now. I couldn't back then because I could see he's teaching false doctrine. Right. Back then, I assumed he was true, and then I couldn't figure out why I couldn't put it all together. Now that I look at it and believe that he's a false teacher, not that he didn't know the real gospel, but he took that as a starting point. Then you have to figure out all the rest in order well, to be need, a good enough Christian. You need to learn how to be the spiritual man. Okay. So he talked about deficient Christians constantly. Okay. So today when I was rereading some of that, I thought, you know what's lacking from me that I wouldn't even have thought about back in the 70s? Once for all. That's what's lacking. Okay. Right. And the once for all needs to be emphasized. And so Nee was saying, and I'll document this in some of our future episodes, but he okay. was saying that the voice of God comes through the intuition, which comes from our spirit joined to the Holy Spirit. He, he, he took a lot of verses out of context. He'd say, for right. example, he was joined to the Lord as one spirit. So then he'd say, okay, there's where you're, your unity is. There's where your reality is. You're joined to the Lord. You're one spirit. Now you got to go to your human spirit, which is joined to the Holy Spirit, and gain intuition so that your soul follows that. And once that becomes your daily reality, you'll be a spiritual man. But... <laughs> So how does he explain then how the church went a couple thousand years without having that revealed to us in Scripture and somehow we survived? Well, the same way a lot of groups do. They, they don't take Scripture alone seriously. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, that's not unique to me. Frankly, Roman Catholicism, Reformed, Lutheran, a lot of people take their own traditions as like the be all and end all. Right. I'm kind of on a mission to get the church to go back to scripture alone and the priesthood of every believer. Amen. We can have our traditions, but they got to be judged in light of scripture. Okay. Right. What I didn't do. Okay. I was attracted to Schaefer because he had in a sense had an alternative to knee, which was that it was bad to escape from reason. Right. And so I, had, so I had those two conflicting ideas, and I didn't know what to do. And I really was never, I've never ever been a good mystic. I'm, I'm pathetic at being a mystic. Engineers usually don't make good mystics. Yeah, so I just always go into the engineering, and I thought, ah, they, they had all these things going on, and we had daily, weekly fasts and constant prayer meetings and trying to hear the word of the Lord in our spirits. And eventually I'd say, well, you know, there's broken cars. I got so nobody's fixing them. I go out to the garage and I fix a car. Ah, now I can do something. I can yeah. use my mind. Um, now, later, this all started making sense. Uh, and in God's providence, that experience of trying to be a mystic and failing. Now, some people will say, see, you, you just gave up because you're no good at it. And. A real, you know, that's fine. They can say what they want about me because my experience isn't normative. The scripture is normative. Right. I'm just telling you why this is important to me and why I'm spending my life teaching scripture alone since the early 80s. Okay. Yeah. Scripture is the inspired, inerrant word of God. God spoke rational, meaningful words in human languages that are meaningful to God and to the hearer. And so when Moses went up on Sinai and in the finger of God wrote in Hebrew, thou shalt not steal, what that meant when God wrote it and what God, that meant when Moses read it and what that meant when Moses preached it are all the same thing. Right. And we use our rational mind to know 
if I take my my neighbors now the command not to covet touches on this don't cover your your neighbors manservant maidservant you know so on wife and whatever and, mm -hmm. and because that will lead to stealing don't steal well a lot of even the mystics say oh yeah yeah we agree we shouldn't steal but how did you do that without your rational mind did you need your spirit to intuit not to steal or did God right. say it now Jessica the second point on this is this all right, so we can see the Ten Commandments or whatever. But listen, doesn't the Bible claim that it gives us all things necessary for life and godliness? Yes. And as non-Catholics, we don't believe the Pope speaks for God. We don't believe the cardinals in the College of Cardinals or the teaching magisterium or all of this. There are traditions of Rome are binding on anybody because they, they're not really apostles. They don't really speak for God. We believe in Scripture alone. So if we believe in Scripture alone, and we believe that in the sufficiency of Scripture, and we believe in the priesthood of every believer, then why wouldn't be, we be like Bereans searching the Scriptures to be these things, to see if these things are true? Right. Well, if we did, we wouldn't find Watchmen these teachings. No, and we can't, let's actually, let's stop there for a second. You've, you've talked in d different series about kind of the three categories of knowledge, and I think that's relevant to this, and it will help us to get those in our mind right now. So the three categories being general revelation, yeah. um, the secret special thing. revelation. Yeah, let me talk about that in a couple different ways. Uh, I've been teaching at Sunday school. I just did this last Sunday. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The right. secret things belong to God. The things revealed belong to us and to our children. And so the things revealed are what's revealed in Scripture. Right. And from there we find true binding and loosing. What's binding and what is the law of God with the law of Christ under the new covenant. And then the secret things are the occult, which we're not to inquire into as forbidden knowledge. And then general right. revelation is what uh, is implied all the way back into even in Genesis 3 after the fall. By the sweat of his brow, Adam was going to have to till the land. And he's going to have to use reason to figure out the difference between a thistle and a tomato. Right. I say tomato because it's August and everybody's got tomatoes here. Um, yeah. And so the, 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 that's categories. So... We use our rational mind to survive on the earth. You know, we just yeah. finished a series with a lady who got delivered out of Kundalini Yoga. And they're, tr they're trying to teach people how to turn off their rational mind in order to come right. in contact with this oneness of the universe. But that, like this intuition idea from the spirit realm that Ni nee had, it's really self-defeating because all those same people, however much time they spend on their kundalini mat, when they get up, they got to go out and figure out how to be fed. Right. They got to go get in your a car and know how to start it and remember line. which way is right and which way is left. Yeah, how to drive down the road or I mean, whatever you do. So what Schaefer was saying that was right, that helped me eventually, that's what helped me get away from me. And back to scripture alone was God intends for us to use reason. And being right. rational is not going to make us quote unquote soulish. It's not going to make us carnal and displeasing to God. Being rational is not going to keep us from being quote the spiritual man unquote to cite the title of Nee's book. And that was liberating to me. In, in, in 1980, that group we were in kind of fell apart and everyone was scattered to go find a way to, to make a living and buy a house and get back into society from that commune we were in. And mm -hmm. I just, I ended up with no choice. And I thank God for this in his providence was to run the scripture 
and the Greek that I'd learned in Bible college and go back to scripture alone and just teach that because there I found all things that pertain to life and godliness. Right. And that, and that's really, everything really does stand or fall on Sola Scriptura. That's the one thing we can be sure of. That's how we can know what God has said, what he has done, and what he expects from us. And we, anytime we go outside of that into feelings or intuitions or trying to, you know, find something in our spirit, we've gone into the realm of the unknown that can't be judged rationally. And it's always, it's always, um, it's always harmful to us. Right. So maybe to summarize that, we've really just talked about that one passage, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. We're going to stop there. This is a prayer that we, the whole person would be sanctified. Whatever components, when we want to debate components, God wants us sanctified. Okay, and that your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete. And I'll give you some more next time. I'll give you some more uh, exegesis on that. But even if there is a difference between soul and spirit, and that's debated. Okay. But if you take the term heart, it's a bigger term, and it covers everything on the inner person. I don't believe that we have the rational capability of looking inside self and saying, aha, soul here, spirit over there. That's beyond How would us. we? I'll I show wouldn't that. even know how to begin to determine that. Well, you can. And I'll show something now. The next time we, in our next session, another verse is in, important to me, and he brings it up continually, is this one in Hebrews. Let me introduce that, where he says, uh, well, I've got so many pages here. Hebrews 4. 12, I believe it is, the, the, so, that the word of God is like a sword that will divide, us, divide asunder Okay. The, the, the bone and the marrow and then the soul and the spirit. So he's using that to prove, well, we can do that. We can divide between the soul and the spirit based on Hebrews 4.12. Okay. And if you take that in context, that's, it's actually describing what's impossible. Right. And so what the author of Hebrews is describing to be impossible, need teaches is to be necessary for sanctification. Okay, well, we are, that is a lot. And I have to admit, it confuses me. So we, I'm glad we have more sessions on this because there'll be a lot of questions, but we are almost out of time for today. Do you have anything you want to add before we close? Well, don't be confused, Sage. It's, uh, it confused me too. Paul's actual meaning is very simple. He's praying that God would sanctify us, and we know that that's the will of God, our sanctification. And that's right. Ultimately, we have a resurrected body, okay, and the whole person will be perfected in glory. And what we are as persons is what God intended, and God made us. And the means of sanctification are means of grace. And they're made in such a way that you don't have to be some special mystic to be sanctified. God actually sanctifies ordinary Christians. Amen. And you know, he gives us the desire for those things that he uses to sanctify us. Dude. No new believer has to be told that they need fellowship or that they need to pray or that they need God's word. We love the things that he uses to sanctify us. Amen. All right. We are out of time for this edition of Critical Issues Commentary Radio. You can access this program and many others along with years worth of articles at our website, cicministry.org. And we want to remind all of you out there, as it says in Philippians 1.27, stand firm in one spirit with one mind and strive together for the faith of the gospel. For Critical Issues Commentary, this has been Jessica Kramus and Bob DeWay, and we'll see you next week. Amen.